Okay, um, then I guess we'll just start here. Um, so I made some slides. There's no kind of um, divine truth in them. I just thought it would be good to have something to serve as a kind of a backbone to any conversations. Um, so yeah, it's kind of my my opinion and my views, um, but hopefully can inspire some discussion. So let's see if this will work. Yeah, so I thought the kind of agenda of these slides is um, a quick review of the objectives of what I hope the technical steering committee can, can achieve. Um, and then a quick look at kind of system partitioning because there's really kind of two main sections as I see it, so the payload um, and then the platform. And then finally, we can basically have an open discussion, but that's not to say that people can't jump in at any point. Um, feel free to, yeah, to jump in if you have anything to say. Um, so kind of the objectives as I see it is that we want to make sure that there's basically clarity of the architecture so that when people are working on things day to day, they don't have to get confused and get lost in, in what it is they're trying to achieve. And then also, I think it's important, and there's been a lot of discussion with Juno and other people that we need to make sure that we um, basically communicate what we're trying to do to the wider community and provide options so that people can join the project easily. Um, yeah, so it's clear what, what we're trying to do and where we need help. Um, and then a kind of a overarching objective is this, of this is to, yeah, try and maintain focus of the goal of, of getting our system in orbit. Um, so, yeah, that's basically the kind of objectives as I see it. Um, so yeah, I think they kind of it's important to look at the system partitioning. So if we kind of the very very high level goal and summed into one sentence is I see it is deploy an open source amateur radio digital regenerative transceiver in a quasi geo orbit. So of course there's many things involved with that high level goal, but I think that's the kind of the main thing that we're trying to achieve at the highest level. So there's the P4X um, DMT payload, which is the actual transceiver um, that will yeah, receive data from, from the ground and then uh, yeah, marks all the different channels together and transmit that back down as a DVB-X um, yeah, transmission. So yeah, we can see here, so I've simplified some of the, the at least for this discussion here, I've simplified some of the things highlighted in the original um, DMT definition document just because I kind of feel that simplicity might be quite advantageous here. So I've just said many, there's no magic number in the 512, um, although it's a power of two, but many M17 channels um, are roughly 10 kilohertz per channel at carrier frequency about five gigahertz, go into the, the payload, um, they will get demodulated, decoded, and then combined and then put into one larger aggregate DVB S2X uh, downlink with a 10 megahertz bandwidth, at about 10 gigahertz. So of course, everything um, is a certain amount of configurability, but I think it's a kind of a high level system dimensioning. I think that, that kind of reflects my understanding of what we're trying to do. Um, so then to do that, we also need to put this thing inside a satellite that can basically maintain attitude, provide power, um, yeah, basically a host for the actual payload itself. But I kind of see these as really two quite distinct pieces of the puzzle. So I think they kind of have separate uh, yeah, development flows. So I think talking first about the payload, um, Again, a very high level, lacking lots of detail, but kind of diagram of the, the system we're trying to build as I see it, which basically has um, some RF followed by an ADC um, to get the, to the sample of the RF spectrum, um, and then many M17 receivers in parallel that receive the data, um, and then go into the GSC encapsulation to then we pass over the DVB S2X um, transmitter, and then finally convert it to analog and RF and transmit it back down. And then of course there's some housekeeping both in the 
kind of digital digital domain um and then outside of that support so these are like things like power regulators and all the things that you need to on a pcb for the the fpj or SOC to actually work correctly so yeah large gateway component gateway component which is a term that seems to be increasing in popularity for VHDL and Verilog. Um, but yeah, there's also non-trivial amount of firmware and hardware that really allows this thing to operate as a whole. Um, so yeah, I think we have pretty good progress on these two elements, the GSC and the DVB S2X. Um, so the work of, of Andre and Anshul have really pushed this quite far actually at the moment. Um, and then we've got the other aspects of the M17 receiver um, we need to look at. And then obviously all the kind of supporting circuitry boards and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, this is obviously a very high level diagram, but I think it would be good to discuss what's missing from the diagram where we need to have some clarity on, on stuff. So I guess there's kind of different layers to it. There's data flow and then there's structure um and then there's kind of hardware as well so yeah what are the important items that we need to find in the architecture to um yeah to provide clarity for everyone um and yeah i'd open the floor at this point to see if anyone wants to jump in offer some opinions i can speak a little bit about the uh, the number of uplink channels um it, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be so many there's been talk about even more, having more than a thousand and having uh, a relatively narrow band signal uh, uplink for each uh, operator. Um, but, it, but it might be uh, worth thinking about, um, you know, down to like like 90, 90 something um, or, or, you know, half of 512. Um, okay. so, so that's also something that we've, we've talked about in case there's a need for, um, more of a guard band for for people that make their own uh, systems or um, you know so so there's a, like like you mentioned that the 512 number the number of uplink channels is is um, flexible and is something with a polyphase channelizer that we actually can reconfigure um, now that ignores some of the filtering requirements and stuff like that and it also flirts with the well if you have a thousand channels can your onboard processing deal with with all of that, um, so so that's an active area of discussion. I don't see any problem with five twelve or a, this or a smaller number being used as a, a baseline. We do need to go ahead and start figuring out where the bottlenecks are for a number of uplink channels. Mm -hmm. Yep. The second thing would be that there is uh, a couple of block diagrams and including a data flow that we uh, that did for Airx project and that we uh, kept revising. Um, and, and that may be informative here because it includes some failure, um, you know, failure analysis or, or failure defense. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it has, has some of the circuitry that would need, be needed for that, some of the RF switching uh, in, in there. So the, okay. you know, so if we ha do have a total failure of the digital board that it is sensed and that we, we, we lose our, both our software and har hardware heartbeat that we then switch over to have just a, um, essentially a, a, a much simpler uh, path that uh, what goes up comes down. So, so all okay. of that is, it should, it's available in the repository, um, but this goes to your second point about making sure that it's clearly defined and communicated. Uh, so there, we have some work to do there to, to properly index and present the, uh, the large amount of work that we've uh, done. Um, but some of those block diagrams, I think, would would answer part of the question about what's missing from this mm -hmm. diagram. Back to you. Which talk is that, Michelle? Which talks about this thing? It's the Any... uh, oh the architect. It's the architectural um, okay. paper for about from originally from A R E X, um, okay. and that we just kept. It's now I think at Rev six. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll take an item to um, to make sure that that's republished and and uh, that that everyone has the link to that. I'll go do that right now. And uh, one more thing from my side, uh, the ultimate target is for M17 receiver. Right now, uh, I'm uh, doing a simplified version where I have, uh, I'm targeting IP receiver, not M17. So again, so you're targeting um, IP? Right now, uh, yes, it's a simple IP stream, not encapsulated into M17. 
Okay. Yep. In, into the GSC. Into the GSC. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I mean that's one of the things that I reviewed the the previous paper, and there's a lot of um, options on the uplink. Um, and I think it would be beneficial to basically choose one thing um, and develop for that one thing with the view that we can extend the options in the future. But, um, yeah, uh, I agree to that. Uh, and I think M17 uh, looks to be the correct choice. But uh, I had a discussion, me and Michelle had a discussion with M17. So M17 lacks, it looks like some of the features which are required for IP, uh, IP protocol conversion to M17. So we did have a discussion with M17 group, but uh, I followed the path of IP and I need to take up this channel back again with M17. What all do I need? But to give them the concrete answer, I want my simple solution with IP to GSC work. And then I, I will be in a better position to go back to M17 and discuss what we need there. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but I agree IP is, is, is quite a nice yeah. protocol to use. It makes everything going to be quite interoperable um, if we want to expand or extend things in the future. Okay, yes, yeah, so I guess then, yeah, it's really that link between the receiver and the GSC, which maybe has the, the greatest, um, well, the least clarity about it we need to work on and define. Yeah, I can take that. Hi, um, can, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, um, so just um, in this diagram, um, so w one thing that I, I, um, I'm, I'm a bit confused is, so if someone on the ground is using, it's gonna transmit using an M17 transmitter and then receive using a, a DVB, like um, why is it two different? Maybe I, like, I, I, I don't understand the, the system where this is inserted or... Um, yeah, I, mean, I get your point. Why, why transmit an M for the user terminal? Why transmit yeah. an M seventeen and receive an DPB? Um, yeah, 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 I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if Michelle has something she wants to say. That I guess that's kind of a, a quite a an old oh. decision. What's the What's the question about the about M seventeen? Um, yes, yeah, so basically how it's kind of an asymmetric link in the sense that a user will mm -hmm. transmit on, on M17 or just narrowband in general, um, but then receive on DVB. Uh, yeah, that's that's been the, the general architecture for a while, uh, at least since 2008 would be um, uh, some sort of FDMA up, frequency division multiple access up. And it was always assumed that, that we would develop our own native digital protocol. Um, this one though is is really good. It's just this is just better than than developing yet another uh, digital protocol. So yes, it's something like M17 up. M17 would be the native one, but honestly, any traffic could be uh, digitized, packaged up, and then put into that particular operator's time slot in um, in the TDM downlink. So yeah, it's, 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 it definitely is asymmetric where DVB, S2, and S2X are transmitted on the downlink and you, you're, you have um, a, a preferred or, or a native digital protocol that will, presumably would allow you to, to more easily access, give you uh, maybe more features. Um, you know, if you're just digitizing traffic, then it's just going to get presented and then you have to do a lot more work at the application layer in order to have a, a communication back and forth with people. Is that, is that sort of in the ballpark of, 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 the, of an answer? Yeah, I think so, I think so. It's, it's really about collecting multiple streams and then broadcast them all out again. Correct, anybody that can receive, um, any station that is listening should be able to receive all the traffic if they are capable enough. And so since we, we have adaptive coding and modulation here. You you could see where there would be situations where a station could listen to everything no problem, you know. But even a, a small portable or uh, marginal station, they 
once they're part of the mix, once they're, uh, they're, they're in the system, um, you know, they, at first they may not be able to, to receive everything. Uh, everybody can receive the physical layer header. And if you look at that and you go, oh, you know, this is uh, below my, my limit of being able to receive, then you can see where the, the link would adapt to that particular radio. That's kind of a neat thing about ACM. Um, so we have the opportunity for doing something pretty, pretty cool and powerful here. Um, and, and that's kind of the, that's, that's one of the big advantages of, of DBBS2. Yeah, great. I, I put the link to the, um, to the architecture documentation that we have in the chat and I'll follow up uh, later with a, with a link in the, in the video and in the notes. Great. Thanks. Okay, um, any other questions or input on this slide, shall we say? Okay. Um, so yeah, obviously um, we've had some discussions with Aaron previously uh, a week ago, last week, anyway. We discussed the open CPI, um, which I think sounds really positive and um, it will be good to Try and integrate that into the project. Um, hopefully, relieve some of our pain points and make things more capable in the future. So um, I'm excited to see how that that progresses. Um, so yeah, this is where I'm just really fully my opinion, but I'm just putting things out. Um, so I try to think of what kind of minor goals we could have in three months and six months. I mean, obviously, the time scales are. Well, yeah, people work when they can, so it's not exactly uh, something enforced, but I was trying to think of kind of steps. So kind of immediate steps is it would be great to start trying to get the, the DVB-S to um, transmit a work that's really quite mature, get that out into the real world um, on the air or on a cable, but basically getting it out through some kind of RF interface, which would be really exciting to, to get that up and running. Um, and then I think, yeah, the, the second immediate thing is getting a more detailed architecture defined. So like the thing that Anshul mentioned, how we're we going to connect the different pieces together so that it's um, maybe not crystal clear, but at least quite clear at a glance of how different, what different parts are and how they, they talk to each other. And then kind of secondary steps, um, I think it would be good to start looking at getting the RF and baseband board schematics started. Um, just start getting some designs down on paper, so to speak. Um, because yeah, that will be a big piece of work. So the sooner we start on that process, the better. Um, and then yeah, basically trying to get a, let's say a prototype RX TX data path. So a single channel of uplink to the GSE and back down to the DVB S2X. Um, so yeah, those are the kind of things that I saw as the key development points over the coming time. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to discuss things that are wrong or missing or what people's thoughts are on this. Next, next steps, basically. Yeah, it looks good. I think it seems like um, we're pretty close to transmitting over the air or over the wire in the lab um, so I I'm I strongly back that as a as a first goal and to do it as quickly as we can yep we good good milestone to each definitely um, okay so kind of key enablers that I, I see is getting the open CPI flow up and running I think will be really powerful and it will hopefully help with some of that over the air testing because we can abstract away the, the horrible interface to the ADI um, chips. Um, yeah, maybe some hardware contributors might want to get involved with the, the schematic and uh, PCB aspect, so the hardware side. So I want to have a think about defining what we need and maybe putting some work packages out people might interested in it might not but yeah it'd be good to see if people want to work on that 
and then yeah kind of Unshield touched on this but um yeah possible con well i know you guys are collaborating with m17 i'm not really up to date on what discussions have been had there but um obviously if we're using m17 on the uplink uh, it's good to yeah maintain contact i know they are supported by ori but, um as i understand it they the current receivers are only software based there's no hdl versions of the receivers is that right there is an effort um, by, um, not just call sign, but Rob, uh, to, to he started working uh, with a pink and Verilog mm. and is uh, trying to, to, to start the process of uh, HDL for, uh, for M17. I invited him to, to feel free to use the lab and to, to share, share his work. Uh, so there is at least some movement towards, towards HDL from M17, I would call it uh, kind of slow and 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 whenever he has time. And I think that that's something that we should start looking at uh, supporting and, and collaborating with him on uh, to to kind of get it into into our into FPGA or ASIC hardware. And there is also another effort. We just ordered PCBs with a RFIC in order to have the first sort of development stations for hardware for M17. Because you're exactly right. Up until now, this has been uh, almost completely dominated by software that's written in order to make MMDBM stations work as repeaters. Uh, and then you, uh, there's a couple of different uh, hand uh, HTs, uh, handy talkies that you make hardware modifications on, and then change to custom firmware, and then they can transmit and receive M17, which I would consider it's just a sm small bit of hardware changes, but it's mainly uh, the, very dominated by by software. So I mm -hmm. hope that helps a little bit. There, there is some uh, uh, effort from, from a, a really neat person to, to start working on HDL for, for M17. Okay, yeah, that's promising. Yeah, that's yeah promising. this is another place where OpenCPI can help because if, if we have software versions of M17, those can be implemented and be running on hardware. I mean, on the, on the targeted devices. And then once HDL, we have some of those components in HDL, we can pair them up and then eventually convert, convert them all into HDL. But I'm uh, just throwing that out there. Thank yeah, you. That's the next point, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, th I was going to say that if we can like build a proof of concept or something that uses like a single channel or a very limited just to get uh, like something that looks like the end-to-end -end, uh, diagram we looked at mm -hmm. and then obviously convert uh, scale up to more channels and and things like and honestly it's, I, I don't know the m17 and i don't know the the, uh, the details of uh, resources for of you know 1k or 512 channels like if the cpu can do can do that you know <laughs> i i would love to write you know or help the uh, conversion to, to hdl um but in practical terms if if it works in in you know, on a cpu then it's fine well why choose when you can do both right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it helps to have a variety of implementations so much, yeah. especially with the sorts of things that we're talking about about doing. Um, and there are some some concerns about the existing software and how it's licensed and what the authors mm -hmm. want to see. So, um, yes, I, I both and not either or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. So um, you said uh, oh, someone using the pink, um, is he on Slack, on our Slack? Uh, no, he's not on our Slack yet. I invited him okay. and he thought that I was trying to make him commit to a whole other project. So I explained myself and okay. I haven't heard back, but he is on the M17. He's very active on the M17 Discord. Okay, yeah, I'm just gonna maybe try to get in touch. And Okay, I can help yeah. uh, with a, I'll help with an email and then we'll figure out where day-to-day -day cool. discussions, you know, uh, and all that, all the communication can happen. I think this falls underneath the whole collaboration with M17. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool, cool, thank you. Yeah, man, I fully agree with your point about um, getting to a, a rough and ready end-to-end -end implementation. I think once we get that, it's gonna be quite an inspiring moment and things will snowball from there. So yeah, it'd be cool to get there. 
Um, if I may ask, uh, is um, is this uh, the radio portion or the radio uh, uh, part of the mi whole mission? Uh, if that's progressed quite a bit, what hasn't progressed? When, when do we actually get to discuss like what are the other challenges? Because I've, I've, over the last few months, I've been definitely seeing a lot of progress, you know, in various things radio related. But what else hasn't been done? Or and is it time now? To put on the table that well maybe we shouldn't do this because there are other people building cube set small set whatever we should just go and uh, also bring those people in under uh, the ori components just you know ask them to contribute to the ori so we don't have to go uh, say take six months to eight months to um um sorry um you can't hear me right or you can't I hear you okay. yeah we can. so, yeah i press the wrong button but um generally like if if there's like n number of projects and and uh, one of the N is progressing very fast on the on the timeline chart or whatever. What what are the laggards so that we actually will have to spend another eight months, you know, trying to figure out the, the one component that's not been touched? Like, is it the power supply? Is it the bus? Is it the, what what other things needed to be done in the meantime so we could parallelly, you know, upgrade them? But I mean, bring them all into the same time time sequence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. In my opinion, the hardware for the, the payload is still a considerable amount of work. Um, it's going to be a big FPGA with all the problems that come with that um, and RF. So it's, you know, it's non-trivial to do the hardware aspects. So in my opinion, yeah, we should start getting some prototypes in that. I would add in the word uh, automatic, uh, automated testing. I, I finally found out after talking to lots of people who apparently I didn't know that they were paying attention to what I've done. Um, they told me that the only reason I, I was able to do 18 months of like development to get to TRL level uh, six and fly in seven and it worked perfectly was that I had um, been running a test loop, hardware in the test loop forever, accidentally by myself, for myself, for my own purposes, nothing to do with formal education programming. And that gave us the, that gave them the confidence to approve it. That was like really funny. I just didn't know that that was so much important. If I hadn't done it, if I'd just done a science experiment, and then showed up at the flight pad, pad, launch pad, it would have probably failed just like everywhere, everything other fails. That's what I also heard from the University of Minnesota team. You know, those students were really like, they're pushing the 100,000 feet boundary model right now, but they've flown up to 30,000 feet in two different, you know, programs. Yeah, absolutely. I guess that's a kind of a different, it's basically continuous integration in a, in a way. You're basically always testing the system. Yeah, I'm just yeah. hoping to add to that part. I mean, I would like to get testing, you know, if you guys are ready to release code, batch code, and okay, then give me a login and I'll just be done. And at least getting some experience with, you know, pushing bits and packets and frames. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So the developing team needs to give out their baby. Is it, what is it called? Like they need to like, you know, say goodbye to the development code version one and then move on to version two or something, right? Um, am I quite sure I'm following? No, I mean, you can you can develop the code to high degree of maturity over time. Mm -hmm. At what yeah. point do you say, okay, this is version 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and just release it so that we can test it, like we can be the testers of, of such code, of, you know, it, 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 you, whether it works or not, use it or not. Whether there's another the track goes at one milestone, you just fork it and then let us test it, and then we give you feedback, and then you keep on going. Yeah, you don't need to wait for any code to be released. We have to publish as we create. So at any point in time, the code is available for you to, to use, test, look at. Uh, what probably would help would be, um, you know, a little bit of versioning to say, okay, well, here's a, here's a, a, a gentle stopping point. Uh, it sounds like that might help, but you don't have to wait. We're not holding back any code. It's all uh, no, released no, as it's uh, created. Well, uh, Michelle, um, the reason I'm saying this, I suppose that the code is uh, designed for some particular hardware that's you know currently particularly in one of the remote labs, and I don't have it. I have my own test bed, but you know my test bed was designed for another purpose. Um, so in order for us to mature the version that will go to space, not my version, that will be a different track, uh, because it might be zinc here and zinc there. But you may be targeting a particular, uh, say, prototype hardware, own design, flight board, whatever. If I end up 
uh, say say you publish it as 1.0. And if I just do testing on 1.0 on my hardware, I might say it doesn't work here, it doesn't work there, change it. But that's not going to actually increase the TRL of your own track, which which needs to be defined. What is the track that you're, you're on? Yeah, the target is the FPGAs that we have in the remote lab. So in the case of somebody wanting to help test and, and do things, you would get an account right. at the re remote lab. You would log in to, to that. You would target the hardware that we have identified as yeah. what we're working with, and, and then you would test there. If you wanted to test it on different hardware, which is a value, as we've talked before about wanting this to be wi as widely used as possible. Yeah. Which with yeah. FPGA code can be kind of tricky as for all the things that you've just said, uh, then your some assembly would be required on your part in order to retarget it. And right. you know it would be up to us to make that as easy as possible. But you want to test and validate, verify, do all those wonderful things, then logging into to our lab would be the the right path forward or the so most you, you, easiest you, you, one. If I logged in, if I logged in and there were these questions of privileges, I would want to be in a group. Uh, or, uh, account where the privileges would be for testing and not for code development. I would actually test the system, test, do the very, I would try to reduce the workload of the development. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's very good. And and I strongly concur with with your your sentiments and, and everything. Um, uh, in terms of like uh, privileges, uh, it I'd if you if you wanted some sort of change to the developer privileges, because that's what we do, we set you up as a developer. Uh, if you wanted some sort of change, then the remote lab staff can handle that. Well, if I'd... it's Unix, I mean, it's as simple as a group mm -hmm. called, you know, I mean, all I'm saying is that if yeah, you that's, formalize that's this, as, if you formalize this part of a plan, then during the review process, the design review pro uh, gate, you would say that, well, yep, yeah, uh, development team did this and then they pushed it out and then the testing team found this and you could describe it in a, in a proper uh, software maturity model, something or other, some kind of practice. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Be documented. Yeah, that's, that's all, that is available through the platform and the, the access that we have uh, through, through Remote Lab. So that's definitely achievable. So yeah, another thing I say is that, so. Um, you'll be the interface, Tom. Oh, no, I was going to say that at the moment it's it's not very exciting to test things because I mean it's proper development practice, but everything's kind of unit test. So basically, you hit yeah. run tests, and then it says pass, and that's done. But once we get into the next phase, which is really kind of integrating these pieces together, then it will be more of an interesting task to actually start running stuff in the hardware and actually see oh, the interaction. I mean, um, uh, generally to get a remote lab account for the uh, purposes of testing and not for like overriding any code or something. I don't want to get into those kind of details at this point. I mean, what, 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 who is the coordinator of the remote labs account? Database? There's i uh, I'll, I'm going to put the, the link to the documentation for how to okay. get uh, involved in remote lab in the chat. Um, Sure. in just a few seconds and and so that you can start the process okay thank, great thank you i mean i think uh, that would be fantastic also uh while you are setting up remote lab just scan the remote lab channel for old messages you will see all sort of problems and solutions posted there okay thanks okay great um what's next okay great so this is the Transition to the from the payload to the kind of satellite bus, um, which has its own challenges. So, for now, the work is really at a high level of abstraction. I think it's hard to really get too far into the details of the satellite Tom, bus. Sorry. Can mm -hmm. Can I ask a question here? Yeah, of course. Uh, if you go back to the previous slide, this one here. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, separate the payload and bus into two. Uh, I mean, you would say trans uh, now transferring from payload to bus. You use some sort of that sentence. What does that mean? I'm not aware of this. Um, yeah, so the payload is the basically the the transceiver that yes. um well yeah that we we work on. Yes. And then typically it, it, you'd have basically the bus, which is the the satellite, so that has the basically all the housekeeping or it has solar panels and power generation batteries, um, attitude control, termination control, bus basically all the things that, sorry? Bus is the satellite. Yeah, so yeah, it's a satellite, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, 
it's just typically in industry often that the satellite will be separate from the payload so some supplier will make a satellite they can reuse partially for different missions and the payload will kind of bolt into that um uh tom uh, can i just ask you like uh, um i i have used the bus as like just the mechanical shell i mean in, in my concepts so mm -hmm. do we have a mechanical shell already picked out um not that i know of do we want to make our own or do we i mean if, first of all uh, making uh, making anything is a I process I have a, I'm sorry, Samandra, I have a question. When you say mechanical shell, what exactly do you mean? Do you mean the f mechanical framework of a of a satellite? Yeah, w when it's mechanical, I'm referring to the fact that if we do nothing, if we don't do anything, it does nothing. It's just struct well structural, structural, you know. OK, you know, yeah, thank you. I, I think I can uh, answer your question. Um, yeah. In general, our mission is to provide the communications package. That's the highest priority, and that's okay. what we got funding for. We okay. want to put it into space. We have m several partners that are very interested in helping us out here. It may be that we have to purchase a lot of the non-communications payload stuff, and that's totally okay. Our, yeah. our mission is not to build the entire satellite from scratch in-house. And if we can, uh, do something cool, like work with uh, AIS on, on thruster technology and incorporate that, we absolutely should do that. And we are very motivated to help anybody that wants to put open source work in space. Um, so we do have, but you know what, that's a huge and expensive undertaking, as all of us that have worked in the satellite industry know. So we do have options, opportunities, potential partners, but what we need to do is focus entirely on the communications package, nail it, show it off, set it up terrestrially, keep doing what we're doing, and then we have a compelling argument for we really do deserve to to get uh, a donation or some help or some collaboration with people where the, the power supply or the thruster is their uh, primary motivation and their primary area of expertise. True, but I would like to modify your um, goal just slightly. The form of the structure is the six U, and that's no, that, I, that's, that's the outside. That's, that, yeah, that's that's, that's the outside. But the, yeah. you know, to fully answer your earlier question, we're assuming a minimum of a six U. No, I I appreciate it's it's a six U. Okay, it, it's um, um, it's generally six U defined as. Um, say 20 by 30 by uh, uh, 20 by 30 by 10 or what's some combination thereof you know uh, three by three by one uh, use times two in parallel or sequence you can stack it and make it cubic but however where I'm afraid of or, I mean what I've gone through um, in my small experience is that if I hadn't paid attention to the interior of the structure the protrusions, the switches, the RB, uh, remote before flight switches, the power buses, the connectors, the other devices that we're going to be interfering with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And step back up and saying, well, that's my, my available volume or potential available volume. Then the board that I designed that had to fit in that potential volume uh, dictated what I could actually put on where, in, because um, in the newer uh, CubeSat quote standards, unquote, um, they have even limited the amount of uh, the type of clocks that you can run on your payload board. I mean, it's because there are other flight computers that are affected by those, um, say, the harmonics of the clock frequencies. Now, I'm just asking because I use switch mode regulators. I did low level power control, whatever. And if I was lucky that it worked, that I'm lucky. But the next version, I wouldn't have been lucky because it would have interfered with something else. So before the cart before the horse or the horse before the cart. If you give me an outer volume, that's great. But what about the interior space? If we just pick a bus. I can answer phenomenal. your question. Yeah. The the way that the cards, the the, the boards that we're talking about, the digital uh, and the analog boards that we're talking about, the way that this was uh, set up and architected by Wally was a one U cards. As but even one year presented you... as presented back in in August. So yeah, but that's our one... that's our baseline. That's what we're going to produce when we do our own boards. It's a, a one U card. Okay, so the one U cards, um, if they're closer to the 
exterior corners and not the middle plane of the, you know, in the middle structure, they have two different form factors mm -hmm. depending on which. So That's whatever right. it is, I mean, it would be nice to know so I can, I can design a board and, you know, give the outline. And I, I've done that so many times. I, I have libraries built up like, okay, it's a, it's a pumpkin board or it's a XYZ board or whatever, or I can just make it like, you know, I can sh shove that to you. To Tom for his keycad work or my keycad work, whatever it can be done. Mm -hmm. That's right. That way we, we can start to lay out things. I think it would probably be a little too early to to lay out uh, until after the sorts of things that we're talking about today are demonstrated as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, to get an end to end system working in the lab. So to do the lab call, that would be first, and then the the there are some things that we already know about the layout just based on the FPGA that we're targeting and the fact that we want to be uh, very highly resilient. So those two things, uh, you know, the particular FPGA and the needs of the FPGA for layout and, and defending it, and then the particular resiliency, higher level resiliency functions that are in the architecture document linked, those two things determine a large amount of the bill of materials and a large amount of the layout, but not all of it. The things that you're talking about are still to be determined because we don't know where exactly in the interior of a spacecraft we will be. So those things will have to be uh, driven uh, by those opportunities when they arise. Those opportunities can arise as soon as I have a, a good demo that I can uh, take out into the world. And I promise you that I will do absolutely everything I can to show it off to whoever will look at it and to see the value that we bring and, and all of that. So I think it might be a little early uh, to, to actually start the work, but it is definitely the right time to bring it up. And I think you've stated it very well. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm saying this that, and this is my you know, you know, cool PowerPoint basically right here. Um, th this FPJ device, I'm like on your you know, test boards and dev boards and everything is like you know, probably wired to some kind of, you know, um, uh, you know components of, of FPJ, of die components. So the timing closures, I mean, you know, eventually on that board are already defined. So in the in the process of I'm laying out my own FPGA board, I'm kind of like having to calculate like, well, okay, so many nanoseconds, picoseconds between the various, you know, uh, uh, various uh, chips. Where would you place the system design constraint so that when we go to board making, we don't end up like, well, okay, excuse me, I can't put the chip here, I can't put the chip there, but uh, you got to change your code. See, the flight code has to mature well in advance of the hardware, or uh, vice versa. That's right. You are, yeah, I mean that's that's yeah more in the payload domain, but um, I mean largely it's split between an, an R, uh, yeah, a baseband board, baseband RF board, a digital board, and then an unspecified um, RF. The actual RF board, but I think it's kind of well defined that there's each of those boards will be a one new structure or one new form factor. Okay. And then, as Michelle says, a lot of the things kind of follow naturally from that. So you're going to be able to um, uh, uh, say defer the decision to uh, uh, position the chips and thereby uh, constraining the uh, pathways. Uh, between memory and and FPGA until a later stage, right? I mean, that's a decision that you're going to shove to a later stage, or you can just do it right now and say, okay, and then the code can mature. Your code has to mature sooner or later. Yeah, so I mean, my opinion is that we should start looking at the hardware now. Um, in my opinion, hardware and, and software slash firmware should be co-developed to a certain extent um, Okay. for so, the, the so, payload. So if I understand you, uh, 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 um, Tom, I'm thinking that you're saying um, that we should at least go with a version one, like the decision tree of what goes where and leave it at then and then design the software to catch up. And then we at least know the outer boundaries that we can't have, you know, FPGA here and, and, and two feet away a memory chip or something, right? Yeah, yeah, I think you do have to have some idea of the hardware and when you're writing the software and vice versa, otherwise you'll end up painting yourself into a corner. Yeah, there's things that we can, we already know uh, about the, the layout based on the target FPGA, based on how much memory we think we need 
and based on how much how resilient we have to be to, to radiation. Those things drive large chunks of this, but not all of it. So there are some things that are going to have to be left until we figure out exactly what package we have. Those are integration questions. Um, but the layout for the things that we know that's under our control, um, it can start as as soon as uh, as soon as practical. Would ORI be uh, willing to um, support actually production of a alpha board? Um, you know, just a, a just a, a plain old uh, board, one FPGA, a couple of memory chips here, there, nothing critical, just so that we could have some experience and and uh, design it. You know, with reviews without actually building it. Yeah, so, that's that's in the roadmap. Um, the, if it if it can be if it if development can be done with the development boards that we currently have set up in the lab, great. The next step is to use the trends gear, which gives you more visibility to the to the FPGA, and then step into uh, our own prototype board. That's been in the roadmap, as okay. presented by by Thomas and others at uh, like at Ham Expo when he gave a walkthrough of the, the roadmap. Uh, so so yeah, I mean it seems like we would have to have uh, prototype hardware, and then after that would be whatever is needed to get to to flight, which is a whole whole other set of work. Um, but yeah, that's that's uh, something that exists in the in the roadmap is our own own board. Okay, thanks. Okay, so on the satellite side, um, and I agree with Michelle that it's too much to bite off to try and build our own satellite from scratch. But I do think, so there's, yeah, basically some high level work that can be done or needs to be done, actually. You basically have to have some idea of budgets for power link budget, thermal budget, propulsion, and well, ADCS, maybe less so. But we have to have basically an idea of the dimensions that we're dealing with, or the order of magnitude of power um, links and thermal. Correct. We have a really good, um, a very good thermal analysis package. We have thermal desktop that we can use. Uh, so as soon as we have anything to analyze, then we have access to that. That's a community resource that we we got. We have a, a large amount of work. The, the By far the best area in your list is the link, link budget. Uh, we have some propulsion work with uh, AIS, uh, but those, those are our small ion engines. So, you know, that's not a good match for a larger spacecraft, but that's an area where we're active and, and keeping keeping up. Power, I would say, has not been addressed very much, and we don't really know uh, our power budget. We assumed um, a very large number, and we assumed the largest number that we could get and not run into thermal problems. And that's as far as we got on that, on that side and um adcs we're actually not in terrible shape there are a lot of options out there um and we do have some resources and some support from from libra space foundation there and others mm -hmm. all right back to you yeah if nothing that's, that's good i think um my opinion is that we should and i, I can do this uh, volunteer myself to do it but i think we should so i like to think in numbers actual numbers even if you know that the numbers are going to be only be approximate but i'd like i think it's good to have a page where we say this is the number we're targeting for power link thermal proportion just so that there's some dimensionality people have a good idea of the dimensions so i think yeah proportion as well can be interesting because even if we went to a major satellite supplier and gave them loads of money. I don't think anyone's done the the orbit insertion that we plan to do. So we have to have a good idea of, of that. I know Anshul's done some work on that. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, I can put in some numbers. So yeah, I have to do some work on that. Um, can, can I ask if, um, can I ask if in terms of what's um, uh, just at a very high level, could could I if if I built a subsystem of uh, a, a cluster of uh, vacuum arc thrusters, and I've designed this before for other missions, and I've designed this for my own hardware and it's flown in space and everything, so I'm I'm starting from that point. I don't have to re reinvent the wheel. Can somebody give me ten watts, twenty watts, thirty watts on demand for a while? Yeah, well, that's that's the 
that's the question really i think so currently if, if memory serves correctly we're pying for 100 watts of the payload but then obviously that drives um solar air, solar panel area um which also drives it's 1.4 kilometers like uh, it's 1.4 kilowatts uh, uh, theoretical per square meter so if we have mm -hmm. a couple of uh, with fold out panels we're we're going to have lots of watts now you can store them or you can let uh some of the float basically uh, of, that's extra of the charge just be utilized for propulsion. And I, I, I've designed those systems, you know, that have actually gone out there. So what I'm asking is, suppose that I uh, just came up with kind of like a first order, a uh, rough order of magnitude estimate that uh, one tenth of a watt per pulse times, say, uh, my last reputed one, um, my last known was 50 hertz. So that's uh, uh, five watts. Okay, at any time, 50 hertz times, let's say, four or five or six, uh, six seven thrusters. So that's 35 watts. Seven, thrust, uh, seven total thrusters at 50 hertz will give you uh, 35 times um, uh, one micronewton. That's 35 micronewton seconds of thrust at any time. I mean, it's really it really can scale up. The question I have is, what? Would you what? When would you like to know it? What would you like to know it? I mean, do you want a model uh, that works in STK or uh, or or GMAT first to see if it does it, or you're going to give me the model and then say go come up with a solution? What would I like? I'd like to I'd like to do an academic. Uh, I, I'd like to do an analysis and present it through or I publish it. Mm -hmm. I mean, my opinion is it would just be have good to have an idea so that if you spoke to this, I'm not saying this is the route that would go down, but say, for example, you spoke to Tyback and said, we wanted to get a satellite from you, that you can say these are the, the order of magnitude on each of these items. And that's basically the starting point of discussions. Um, right. That, yeah. And okay. yeah, I would say Anshul would be the lead here for, for the work that's been done on um, Orbit C works or has worked mainly in uh, GMAT. Okay, so um, Anshul, um, over to you. Um, you're the lead. I'm coming in as a propulsion system, whatever, you know, developer. What would you, and I'm not AIS, so what would you want from me? First time interaction. Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's, it's completely a topic that we can go into more details about the requirements and all other things. So can we take this offline? Yeah, you, you, you please invite me to a meeting uh, sure. you know, uh, uh, that you're going to host okay. so okay. that you can begin to collect your notes. I, I'm just requesting you that maybe today or maybe next day or next month, mm -hmm. but you've got Zoom, whatever, recording mm -hmm. and ORI obligations. So just go ahead and just put me on a, on a list of people that you want to talk to. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, so basically kind of mirroring that slightly is yeah basically i think the only real actionable work we can do on this at the moment is just to have yeah an idea of order of magnitude on these budget items um and then we have to wait a bit longer before we can have much more maturity in the the payload before we can really take the, the satellite side any further um yeah i'm not going to go through this pretty Quickly. Um, Perry, mm -hmm. uh, why three months and six months? What's the the there's there's no real significance to the times. Maybe I shouldn't have really used quantified times, but in my mind they're just basically um, immediate steps and then kind of the second steps. If you make sense. If possible, I mean we could do this on a rolling basis, and I'll uh, ask you to just you know do it on a linear time, like you know, semesters, quarters, whatever, so that, you know, we, we can, you know, we, we can all commit time. There is a level of commitment to do this and then, and other people will be using that from that point. So six months is like way down the line, nine months. And that's like next year. Yeah, yeah. I think the original <laughs> idea is to have these quarterly. So it's kind of fits into those kind of what, what we hope to achieve for next time we meet type idea. Yeah, let's uh, get back on track. We can talk about the, the actual quantities of the numbers a little bit later. 
So I think that basically comes to the end of the slides. So yeah, what have we missed? What challenges, what opportunities? Um, yeah, basically what people's thoughts and things that we, yeah, we want to discuss. I uh, just want to uh, summarize and highlight one important point. One of the main thing going forward and short term goal for me uh, personally, and I think Sohoto is also working on that and uh, just wanted to bring it to you, Tom, is to get end to end system working. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I have been trying with IP and get the transmitter end to end working and get all the components. You talk of GSE, you talk of uh, the DVBS2 protocol impl uh, implementation. So bringing that all together and uh, uh, in in a keeping 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 thing in a simple term, I want uh, I want to transmit video, a simple running video, IP, uh, GSC, FPGA, and then to RF. That's what I'm aiming for, and that's a short term goal. Uh, what I'm trying to achieve, and I okay. think Soto and Tom, that's that's the. Strong, strongly agree. We have an opportunity this coming Thursday to demonstrate um, a beacon, a, an example of our system as a beacon in Los Angeles to one of the technical groups. So I think I'm going to go ahead and take take that as a, um, a really good short deadline to get something transmitting over the air. Um, so you, you may have seen some of the videos that are posted about the beacon work, but like this could be part of this end to end system and I could not strongly more strongly agree um working over the air is to me that's the that's all that matters is and that it should work quickly so that we fail quickly and figure out what's wrong so yes um I have a little bit of work that and I've pulled in a couple of people to help me with the python uh, so when we talk about an end-to-end -end system uh, and a lab call to me a lab a lab call like a lab phone call laboratory phone call um means that things are working, but it might look ugly. You know, it's a bunch of dev boards strung together, uh, code that's uh, holding hands, you know, <laughs> and, and and all of that. And the the other thing that we, that we have talked about in the past that we haven't really addressed today is uh, like a some sort of end-to-end -end model or something like a simulation. In the past, we assumed that GNU Radio would be a good place for this. GNU Radio has some significant limitations that we've run into. And I've talked with both uh, ben Hilburn and Derek Cozell and a couple of other people in the architecture team, and we, it really can't do our full simulated system um, end to end with the bandwidths and speeds and numbers of channels that we're talking about. So I think that we need to kind of maybe back up and say, okay, do we need to do everything in MATLAB or Octave? Do we need to, can we do it an end to end system in open CPI? You know, what I've seen so far is that may actually uh, help us with the FPGA parts and that we actually can um, can achieve an end-to-end -end simulation. Because uh, I think we're going to need a simulation in addition to the physical end-to-end -end, like lab call. Right, yeah, I think C open CPI is, is probably the best <laughs> candidate for helping us there. I mean, if we have C++ implementations, which basically is going to be radio implementations, then we can, as my understanding, we can basically create the, yeah, just a simulation on a PC, which matches the HDL. But um, Aaron can maybe mention more. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that is possible. Um, but you're, again, we're going to run into that same implementation that the radio has. This is, you can't feed the DAC with, you know, the, the 10 megahertz signal. Um, and everything's running in software, then there, there are there are some limitations there. But if you want to do a simulation that's offline, um, and and then uh, that's that's a possibility as well. And so it, it just depends. Yeah, I'm working on a waveform now, and and the way that we've well, we start with uh, simulate model as well. So yeah, it just depends. Transfer. Yeah, I mean, I know we mentioned in the call the other day, but for me, it'd be amazing if we could do Python as well. But I understand it's not possible at the moment. Yeah. Um, um, yeah okay. I think I that's ask, the best. Uh, could I ask Aaron? Aaron, is it? Um, uh, hi, Aaron. This is Shomudra. Uh, hi. Um, if I haven't used OpenCPI before, but I feel the need to do uh, to adopt OpenCPI because you know I've been reading about it and stuff, and we talked uh, earlier. Um, is it that OpenCPI would um, be able to be utilized without MATLAB? Efficient? Yes, yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah. 
So I, I use Octave because I don't have access to MATLAB anymore. So I'm just kind of curious as to like, you know, what I could do. I've, I've done some uh, calm systems modeling in Octave crudely. Yeah, yeah the, there's no there's no direct connection in OpenCPI to MATLAB and or Octave. Um, okay, so Simulink is, the discussion of Simulink is just convenient. It's it's part of, if somebody has MATLAB, they could use Simulink. Yeah. In general models. Yep. Okay. All right, Thomas, you have what's the best way to share this information on the slide? And that's a big, a big deal. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts? Um, so I think probably adding a couple of extra pages to the phase for radio.org website with yeah, some kind of highlights of, of what we want to do. So if, once we get a little, basically looking at making a detailed architecture of this diagram, which is a very high level point of being useless, but make a more detailed um, diagram of this. So that's um, one uh, thing. Tom, any mention of the antennas in this system? No, we're not discussing antennas today. OK. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, but I think basically a couple of extra pages on the the site would would be good. Um, documenting yeah as, as much okay. as possible at the highest so, level. Yeah, um, so like following this diagram to have some some pages or some maybe a call out or a clickable diagram to go to discussions and then people can drill down maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that shouldn't be too hard. Let's see what we can do. But yeah, I'm also interested if other people have any opinions on the best way to share this information. Okay, I guess not. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't have anything to add other than the, yeah. the idea that we have have something at the top level that people can can click on. And then if they want, that, then it gives them the opportunity to get the high level overview very quickly and to see mm -hmm. this this laid out. And then it naturally sort of organically flows down into more and more detail uh, so that people can find it. So I, I think that's good. And, and um, I, you know, being a, a simple person, <laughs> just, that's, that's about it. I don't see anything else other than we keep publishing everything that we create as we create it as soon as possible. And that we keep looking at the repositories to keep improving them and maybe prune them back every now and then or combine them, you know, to keep, keep up that sort of vigilance. And then any of the recordings that we make of meetings, we put those uh, in the right playlists and, and keep that uh, together um, and just try not to fragment or scatter the information too too much um, and I think that's that's pretty much it there isn't anything more to to having a good good presentation of documentation than than just doing that and just continually trying to improve it mm -hmm. um, could I ask Tom one question in the block diagrams um, those are sub subsections right uh, I mean of the of the system mm-hmm um, do they reflect like logical partitions in the schematic? So therefore, there are interface uh, between the different uh, uh, sections. So very, very, very loosely, you can consider the kind of lighter gray section to be basically um, like uh, inside the, the FPJ and/or processor, and the darker section to be basically like a PCB level. Okay. It's a very loose so, definition. Um, you, you must be running a, um, a, a, your own like uh, list of signals lines, right? Lots of inter interfaces. I mean, if you expand the FPGA design, you'll show up, I'm sure. If, if you look in the linked document, the architecture document, there's an interface drawing and, and you can okay. see uh, what we have so far. Yeah, I think to just um, repeat what Many people have said, I think the most important thing now is that we can get an end-to-end -end system because I really think once we can start playing with an end-to-end -end system, it will change a lot of things. Um, it will be really cool to see and it will yeah, inspire more people. Yeah, for 
end-to-end -end as in, um, not end-to-end, -end, but over the air, um, like if we're transmitting video, like um, the current, the, the SDVB, uh, sorry, the DVBS2 encoder, uh, like you, you have to sort of format the frames, uh, but like if I have, say, the video, I can probably write some sort of script to sort of chunk, you know, chop and generate something that you can feed. And so it, like you don't need uh, uh, like an IP stream or M17 or I think the GSC can be bypassed just to sort of get a demo um, mm -hmm. of, you know, like a, a loop or something. Going right, so, um, so um, um, uh, Andre, is it? Um, I, I yeah. think in this block diagram, within the housekeeping, there could be a potential square bo blocks called test signal. Yeah, we have mm. that in the architecture document that was linked right. earlier. It's uh, the, the, the default digital uh, download section. Yeah, I, I'm just referring to what's missing from the diagram question. That's all. I'm just thinking that, you know, that way the test yeah. generator is built into the, to the yeah, flow. Yeah, just refer to the, to the published work for, for the ideas that we, we have uh, been developing. The, the, the RX uh, diagram. Yeah, yeah. Originally, it was the A R E X R X diagram. Correct. Oh. It's the it's under in uh, if you go to face for ground documents, um, then let's see. I'm backing up to find it. Uh, engineering requirements architecture is where all of that stuff uh, is is found. The PDF mm -hmm. and then all the supporting uh, drawings uh, as separate. So the the idea of a default digital downlink um, or digital content um, coming at you uh, has been that that's in the the plan. Mm. But if, then there was a discussion it, with Ron Economos about whether or not we should uh, start out with like having a beacon or start out with using um, a MPEG as a transport stream. I don't really think that's a good idea uh, long term. However, short term, there's an awful lot of people that have um, amateur television stations that will receive it. So it's a balance between getting traction with the hardware that's out there versus bringing something that's a big step forward to people. Now, if we choose and we have chosen GSE over, over the other transport stream, that means it's on to us to make it easy for people to, to receive. Uh, and having a default digital uh, downlink, you know, something that's, if there isn't any traffic, then it, it has a, essentially a test signal that you can then use, just like we use microwave beacons on the air all the time to test our microwave stations. Uh, then you have a, a test signal going on all the time that that is of great value. So it can run through all the different mod CODs. It can provide different types of uh, digital uh, content. You can do, you know, here's a video signal at the top of the hour. We're going to go. We're going to run through all the mod CODs, things like that. So um, if I understand you, Michelle, uh, in this diagram that's on the screen uh, below the DVBS two X green block, could there be a potential? Um, uh, you know, say just for conveniently a test signal, but that would all feed into the RF. Uh, uh, I mean, it would either be going through a selector switch or in parallel to the RF D2A converter so that we generate in the same band um, separated by a few uh, megahertz or so, two carriers. One, your generate DVB, uh, you know, a multiplex stuff, and another is just occasional test signals for, uh, you know, uh, like SSTV, for example. Both has been both of those things have been discussed as possibilities, um, but the the general thinking is that there's one downlink signal, one carrier, and the default digital content will occupy um, this occupy the downlink when there is no uh, operator traffic. But isn't it a requirement that I mean it's a pretty much for all the satellites that I've used, um, if this is going up near geo or whatever or whatever I mean obviously. A beacon, an analog beacon, not an RF digital it's, beacon. But... This is not an analog system. Okay. Uh, Michelle, this is Mike Parker. Hi Jack, there, Mike. I'm, yeah, Hi. I've been li I've been listening and hanging on here, and not, most of you guys don't write, know me, but I'm involved in the uh, University of Arizona CatSat six U. Low orbit uh, satellite that's scheduled to be launched next summer, and I'm, and over the last two years we've been working on 
having a VBS2 downlink. And we're to the point now where if somebody wanted to have have a low orbit beacon uh, that uh, was transmitting DVBS2, we could can, we can certainly accommodate a test pattern uh, that of your definition. And we'll be glad to give anybody that's interested uh, the information as to how to receive the data that we're transmitting down, which is basically HF uh, re relay and also uh, uh, some video. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, Mike, generally, if I could just follow up, um, HF relay like above the ionosphere, down below, or from HF ground to Leo to back down? We're considering, we, we have a receiver, which is a store and dump system. So we receive HF at some point in the orbit and then dump it back to the ground station. And we're talking about experiments that do both propagation experiments, uh, whisper signals, for okay. example as well as uh, uh, radiation from Jupiter. Oh, beautiful. Um, I've, uh, I've been part of the AMSAT community for a while, and I read some of their old archives. They were given to me by Pat Perry Klein, and he's been trying to you know, guide me for a number of years now. So apparently, in the early days of AMSAT, HF was it. That was the way they would communicate back and forth. There's even an older satellite spec and circuit diagram still around in my archives of the HF beacon down to Earth. Weird. Yeah, so this is a digi digital version where we do digital uh, compression uh, effectively uh, on the uh, receive and then put it over DBBS2 to get it back down to the ground. Okay. And then and the DBBS2 will be down at 10.4 uh, 10, uh, 10 gigahertz. And the um, modulator, is that a commercially sourced? Modulator. Or yeah, unfor that? unfortunately, it's not open source. It's it's uh, it's an Astro SDR board that's built by Rancon Research, okay. and and using code that uh, uh, not all of it is owned by Rancon Research, so we aren't able to just give it away. Mm -hmm. But uh, we uh, we're trying to be as open as we can. Yeah, we uh we we tried pretty hard to convince uh or. Uh, not convince Mike because I think Mike understands uh, what we're about and what we're trying to do. Um, but we we did make a bid for uh, to try to get this project to be an open source uh, satellite. Uh, so some of it is not, um, but it's a big step forward, and it's the I believe the right, absolutely right technology, and I'm very very excited to see it uh, go up. Um, and genuinely and, and deeply appreciate Mike's uh, support and advice uh, over the past couple of years. And um, the, first, the, the thing I'm looking at, it comes out uh, up to uh, six gigahertz. So the missing element right now is an up, up converter to go from, we'll be running an IF of 2.4 gigahertz and with a, and we need to up convert that to uh, six uh, to 10.4 gigahertz with an eight uh, gigahertz LO. So if anybody um, has one of those sitting around, give me a call. Um, uh, Mike, uh, is it uh, uh, a proprietary channel or, or uh, a, I mean, open access channel, ham radio channel? And if we if it is open uh, for you know for public reception, um, could we set up a whip antenna and pick it up, or do we really need a dish because the gain is going to be so low, or the EIRP is going to be so low? And we, we unfortunately, there, there's two answers to that. One is the the gain is and power is very low, and you're going to need a dish. The other part of the answer is that we can we have a one of the experiments is an inflatable antenna and with 20 dB plus gain. So if there are people that are trying to listen to it, we can coordinate maybe uh, dumping it in your direction to help the situation. Um, but, but there's not going to be anything proprietary about the data we receive. It's all going to be made, put on the web. And this is, uh, it's DVB-S2, S2X standard downlink. So It's a, a DVB-S2, not, not an X, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, but the, hey, that's, that's, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah, factors compatible, of course. Um, uh, yeah. Mike, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear the word inflatable because my master's thesis was uh, on uh, interplanetary networks where I used STS-77 inflatable antenna experiment as my model uh, married with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter 
and about 150 relay stations for a universal uh, network um, spanning the solar system, uh, able to be utilized all of the time, regardless of the geometry of the planets. And uh, that was published in 2011, but the crux of the problem, the solution was uh, with JPL that I worked out was uh, with the inflatable antennas, 14.6 meter class. So I did it, did all the math for that. It was fun. And then they, that's cool. The, the company that's doing the inflatable antenna is free fall here in Tucson. Then the, that's their baby. Looking forward to it, absolutely. Now I'm really interested. I'll follow your project because uh, I, des I designed the I math around the old inflatable stuff. That was fun. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't really have anything else. I think my main. Uh, action here is that I'm going to make a more detailed diagram of this, more detailed version of this, um, and then basically start sharing it with you guys. And you can tell me where it's wrong, and then we'll kind of iterate a few times. And then once you're happy with it, we can stick it on the website. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of, I think, the next steps from my side anyway. Cool. I will help you out as much as I can. Thanks. Okay. Well, um, does anyone have any last things they want to mention? Uh, did you um, uh, already in the architecture uh, details include a BITE component built in test environment? The final um, I, okay. I don't know of one. Oh, I don't think it's in there currently. But yeah, it's a good thing to think about. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. OK, great. Well, thank you all for your time. Um, and yeah, I think it was hopefully useful and yeah, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. This is a great step. Do you have a date in mind for, uh, the next quarterly meeting? I think it'd be good to go ahead and schedule that now. Um, okay. Yeah, I can, yeah, I'll suggest the date and circulate that round. Wonderful. We'll put it on the schedule and then, um, and then work towards, towards that. Um, mm -hmm. that'll be a good a good uh, sort of gathering point for all of the work. And uh, yeah, I like the three and six month thing and uh, the, the near term, um, I'll be working with the usual suspects to get a uh, uh, sort of a multi multimedia beacon um, demonstrated by, by Thursday. Uh, and then we'll, anything that we do weekly stand up meeting is where that will be. Um, and we're gonna strive to keep it um, what we've done, what we, have planned uh, any roadblocks uh, and any ne necessary resources, I anticipate that the number of people attending may start to go up. Um, so we want to try to keep that to be uh, 15 minutes or less, which was just can be adjusted a little bit upward if we get uh, more people. Um, but the weekly standups will be recorded and posted as well to sort of keep um, a good summary uh, of, the, of the work going on for, for these sprints. Back to you. Okay. Oh, yeah, excellent. Yeah, can I just uh, ask um, the group, um, do we now shift to partitioning the, uh, well, just thinking of the of the channels, but really Slack channels are great, you know, ad hoc mechanisms, but like say propulsion could be one track, major track, um, major tracks, like, you know, radio is a major track, propulsion is a major track, orbital analysis is a major track, but basically have standups, you know, literally in that, in that, uh, you know, stratified, uh, you know, we stratify the work, basically, not just combine things. We currently have an FPGA focused standup, which covers our primary focus, right. which is developing a communications payload. Right. And meetings are scheduled whenever there's a need. Uh, so as soon as there's enough work to have a standup on things like propulsion, which spacecraft propulsion and bus um, and a number of other things all currently have channels. Um, so that once the activity level rises up to the point where it requires a stand up to organize the work further, then they happen. Um, but the, the meeting schedules are driven by the level of activity. Okay, well, if the next quarterly meeting is a quarter away, that's 90 days. So, you know, time to, you know, um, yep. put it on the calendar. Yep, well done. I'll suggest the date and let you guys all know. Very good. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Well, um, speak to you all soon.
Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for inviting me.